Good morning, everyone. I'm Kelly Bourne, Executive Director of the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford University, and want to go ahead and get us started today with our conversation debriefing the 2020 elections, or at least discussing where we are so far in what is a ongoing uh, election period. And I'm glad to be hosting this event in collaboration with our partners from Stanford's Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society and the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence here at Stanford. We have a great group of panelists here today from across the Cyber Policy Center, as starting with Nate Persley, who is the faculty co-director of the Cyber Policy Center. He is the director of the Program on Democracy in the Internet, and also the co-lead of the Healthy Elections Project alongside MIT. We are also joined by Alex Stamos and Renee Duresta from the Internet Observatory here at the center. Alex is the observatory's director and also the former chief security officer, first at Yahoo and later at Facebook. And Renee Duresta, who is the research director here at the observatory and together are helping to lead the Elections Integrity Partnership, which we will talk much more about later. We're also joined by Andy Grotto, director of the center's program on geopolitics technology and governance, and before that, a top cyber policy advisor in both the Obama and later the Trump White Houses, and by Maricha Shake, the center's international director of policy and an international policy fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI. Before coming to Stanford, Maricha was a legislator in European Parliament and one of the leaders in, in tech governance there and are joined also by Rob Reich, Associate Director of the Institute for Human-Centered AI here at Stanford, a co-director of the Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society, and also a partner of Nate's on the Cyber Center's Program for Democracy and the Internet. Uh, so really a great uh, group of discussants this morning. Our webinar will go for 90 minutes. And uh, quickly, for those of you who might not be familiar with the Cyber Center, all of our research and teaching focuses on improving the, improving the governance of digital technologies when it comes to questions of security, geopolitics, and democracy. We are home to about a half dozen programs, about half of which are represented on today's call, and all of our work is intended to help inform the policy agenda for governments, tech companies, civil society, and academia globally again, when it comes to these questions of how best to govern digital technologies. We host these webinars every other Wednesday at 10 a.m. PST, although again, today's is somewhat a unique one for a variety of reasons, uh, much like the elections have been uh, rather unique this year. Uh, the results, of course, are still unknown, and we are waiting uh, on seven key states in particular. I think these elections have proven to be really unprecedented. I, never before have we seen something like this, and I, I sincerely doubt we will ever see ones like this again, uh, both because of the many concerns, of course, related to COVID and administering an election in these conditions, and also the ongoing concerns that first arose in 2016 about how our new information ecosystem is, is affecting the, the political information environment. So, so with all of that, I want to start first with Nate and Nate ask you to take about 10 minutes. Uh, Nate, welcome. You launched the Healthy Elections Project with Charles Stewart at MIT many months ago to assist election officials and the public with the many logistical challenges under COVID, challenges of creating safe and secure polling places and rapidly transitioning to mail-in ballots. Uh, of course, a particular challenge in the U.S. context with our extremely decentralized system of elections and more than 10,000 different voting jurisdictions, and then made even harder with COVID, given how heavily our system relies on volunteers rather than paid public officials to man polling places, and with most of those volunteers being over the age of 60 and thus particularly vulnerable to COVID. Um, your project has been tracking not only the logistical challenges, but also the many legal challenges, which I think at last count were at more than 400 lawsuits that you and your team have been tracking, challenging almost every aspect of mail-in voting. Uh, so would love to hear from you, you know, what we know about how polling places and mail-in balloting performed uh, this election cycle, any observations from the more than 400 cases and appeals that you've seen related to mail-in voting, 
And I think you and your team also did a whole series of scenarios that take us well out into January about the kinds of legal and other challenges that we can expect. So um, Nate would love to hear from you for about 10 minutes on what you guys have observed. We'll then have 10 or 15 minutes from, for Q&A and people can enter questions into the chat box. We'll then turn to Alex and Renee for 10 or 15 minutes of comments followed by specific questions for them and then go to the rest of our panelists and save about 20 or 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, but Nate would love to start with you and thanks for, for coming. Great. Uh, well, as you said, the election is not over. Um, we are still in the thick of counting the ballots and um, we need that process to continue. I'll talk a little bit about the Healthy Elections Project, but I'll also talk about where we are right now and what we can expect over the next few days. Um, so if we turn back the clock to February and March, um, when the pandemic's effect on the election became apparent, um, I sort of took off my cyber policy hat for the most part and put on the hat I used to wear when I was the research director of the Presidential Commission on Election Administration. That was the, the commission um, where I was appointed by the, the former White House counsel for President Obama and Mitt Romney's lawyer, Ben Ginsburg. Um, and we um, dealt with all kinds of problems from long lines on elections day to voting uh, technology issues to uh, natural disasters in voting. Uh, we did not have pandemics in voting on our agenda uh, at the time, um, but when the pandemic's effect on the election became apparent, I, I then paired up with my um, colleague, Charles Stewart at MIT, the nation's leading political scientist on election administration to uh, start this Healthy Elections Project, which you can see at healthyelections.org. Um, We've now produced over 100 research papers there, many of which are now um, uncomfortably relevant given the um, issues with the vote counting in the battleground states. So everything from signature verification to provisional ballots to ballot curing, uh, as well as, as you said, the uh, COVID election litigation tracker, which shows 350 or so lawsuits. And we will try our best to put the current lawsuits in there uh, in, in, you know, as soon as possible, but, but there's certainly gonna be a lag there. Um, and so, so what we saw, what motivated this project um, was the problems that we saw in the early primaries. And it's really important to benchmark our success on November 3rd against the disaster that we saw in many of these primaries. And so in March, when Wisconsin held its primary, um, we saw them close 97% of the polling places in Milwaukee, for example. Um, we saw that uh, New York over the summer ended up disqualifying something in New York City, almost 20% of their absentee ballots. Um, and so the, the, the COVID effects on this election seemed dire and transformative. And what we saw over the last six, seven months was a complete revolution in the way that we run elections in this country. Um, for some states, it was not as, as dramatic because you had states that were all vote by mail, like um, uh, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, uh, Utah, and Hawaii. And then what happened is several other states, including our own California, um, New Jersey, and uh, Vermont and, and Washington DC and, and one or two others uh, decided to join them in mailing every, um, every voter a ballot. Um, uh, but I want to, and Nevada is one of those as well. I, what I, what I want to emphasize though is for the most part in these states that are now at issue, um, they, their system is the same one that President Trump votes on, which is an absentee ballot system where you request an absentee ballot and then uh, you return it um, by a particular date. And so, um, but there are, there were many growing pains in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, though I just heard the head of the, um, uh, of elections for Wisconsin say that they're pretty much done with their counting. There's only about three to 500 votes that are left. So the, the results should be pretty secure there. Um, and, but, but Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and North Carolina had historical rates of absentee balloting at around 5%. And so uh, to move then now to roughly 50% absentee balloting in those states did require an incredible amount of um, work. Um, in addition, those states did succeed, I think, in um, putting out healthy polling places. Uh, this is something in our partnership with the Stanford Design School that we tried to uh, put up a lot of uh, uh, models for them. A lot of the training was uh, in some of those states. Uh, the, the materials provided by the, the D school uh, were quite helpful. Uh, you can see their work at healthypolls.stanford.edu. And um, as a result, uh, we saw 
very little in the way of lines on election day. We saw significant lines in some of the early voting uh, in, in Georgia in particular. Um, but if you look at um, yesterday, uh, the, what you saw is that basically voters were able to go through, through the line um, and had, had low wait times. That there wasn't much, I mean, the, the predicted violence that a lot of people thought was going to happen uh, in the polling places never materialized. To be sure, there are always problems, right? And, and attempts at voter suppression were met with voter protection and voter resilience. Um, but we didn't see some of the nightmare scenarios that a lot of people um, had legitimately feared, uh, either in election day or in the pre-election period. And um, what we saw was historic turnout, um, a higher turnout of, as a percent of the eligible population than we've seen in the last 100 years. And so over 100 million ballots were count, cast early, um, either in person early or through mail. Um, another 50 to 60 million, when it's all said and done, will have been uh, uh, counted after that, um, either election day or late arriving absentee ballots. And so this is you know, a remarkable achievement from the standpoint of election administration, however you measure it. Um, they, you know, in the face of a pandemic, an incredibly polarized political system, um, you know, issues of disinformation and accusations of fraud hanging over the entire process, they were able to transform it uh, and to get through the system a record number of voters. Now, what you're going to see in the coming days <laughs> is, is a um, picking apart of that electoral administration system by adversarial uh, by the adversarial process. That's what happens in close elections, right? And I often say that close elections make for bad democracy, um, especially in polarized societies, uh, because at least half the population is going to be unhappy with the result. Um, and so we have um, you will start hearing certain things um, in the the battle over the ballots. Now, I want to emphasize that there is a process to deal with absentee ballots and to deal with challenges to absentee ballots. That um, one of the virtues of this election was that we had a significant amount of litigation before the actual election day. And so there was clarification of the rules before election day that then will make some of these, um, what might have been legal gray areas, less gray and more black and white. And so, um, what you what right now um, it looks like almost all of Wisconsin is done. Um, the Republicans have suggested that they will challenge, perhaps push for a recount, which is um, probably their right under under Wisconsin law. Um, the the two lawsuits that we've seen in Pennsylvania already deal with um, provisional ballots and and sort of the curing of absentee ballots. And curing is a process by which if there's a problem that's discovered with an absentee ballot, like the failure to sign the absentee ballot or the failure to put it into a secrecy sleeve and the like, uh, is there a way to alert the voters or alert the candidates and political parties to find the voters so that that voter can um, uh, remedy any deficiency. And so there's a, a, the fight that we are seeing in Montgomery County and, and, and in another Commonwealth Court of Pennsylvania case is, and in fact, that, that, that uh, oral argument just happened uh, an hour or two ago, uh, is whether the, um, whether the counties uh, were sort of violating the state law in um, allowing voters to cure these problems with their absentee ballots. We don't know how many votes are really in dispute there. Um, similarly, we don't know how many votes will be segregated under the um, um, sort of risk averse approach that the state has taken in response to the US Supreme Court's 4-4 decision earlier a month ago, um, because basically the Pennsylvania Supreme Court extended the uh, deadline for three days for receipt of absentee ballots. We don't know how many ballots that might uh, implicate, but I want to emphasize that we're we're sort of not there yet. Uh, as much as the the lawyers are being activated, we are still in an administrative process where the election is still going on. That we are just counting ballots, and these are not newly arriving absentee ballots. I mean, maybe we'll see what happens with those that three extra days in. Pennsylvania, but the ballots that are being counted now, some of them were cast weeks ago, right? 
But because of the failure of the legislatures in these states to expand and extend the vote processing period to the pre-election period, um, the administrators were prohibited from uh, dealing and counting with the absentee ballots until uh, either election day or until the polls closed. And so as a result, we're now pushed into overtime where there's going to be um, you know, a lot of anxiety over the counting of the absentee ballots. Um, but this was to be expected, right? We knew that there was, that not only were there gonna be a lot of absentee ballots, but they were going to shift the results. Um, we, even before this election, we talked about a red mirage followed by a blue wave. We'll see whether that blue wave really does change the uh, results, but, but right now is the time to be calm <laughs> and to uh, trust the process as they say in Philadelphia uh, and to make sure that every ballot is counted. And then we'll see if there are legitimate challenges uh, that can be made to that process. Great, Nate, thank you so much. And we have a, a number of questions uh, coming in here. I wanted to start with um, a question related to the challenges that you've started alluding to and this, this concern that some of them may have merit, whether particularly in the swing states, if some of the challenges the GOP are likely to bring could prevail. I know there are many, many challenges outstanding right now, but are, are there any that you think hold particular merit, I guess in, in particular, given that we have conservative judges in so many uh, of our important courts? So the challenges that have already been brought in Pennsylvania um, are what I would call sort of preliminary challenges to set up a larger legal theory that would cast out on the results. And so right now, you know, it, they're still kind of in formation in a lot of respects. We don't even know how many ballots are implicated by those arguments. And, you know, to some extent, we are all um, accustomed to thinking about election disruption and, and disagreements um, according to the playbook of Bush versus Gore 20 years ago. But we have sort of selective memory about what that process, how that process unfolded. Uh, actually, at the time, the, if the day after the election, everybody thought the issue was the Palm Beach butterfly ballot. This was the confusing ballot design that led some people to accidentally vote. Um, for for Pat Buchanan instead of Al Gore. Um, and so that was what everybody was looking at. And we knew it was a close election. And so they kept, uh, they kept counting the votes. Um, but all the issues of dangling chads and hanging chads and the like, and, and, and litigation over equal protection, that really sort of culminated after uh, weeks of vote counting and, um, and other court cases. So there's a state process that needs to unfold first. We, the, right now, all the all of the litigation in at least Pennsylvania is in the state system. Um, whether there is then a federal constitutional question, um, we will see. Uh, and and the, as I said before, they're laying the groundwork for that by making arguments that the um, Secretary of State and the local election officials somehow departed from uh, state law by allowing voters an opportunity to correct defects in their ballots. Now, it's not clear what the remedy would be because these ended up being legally cast votes. These are voters who, um, you know, these are actual people who uh, cast votes. And so to then cancel them because the uh, local administrators made it too easy for them to vote um, seems like a stretch. Uh, but, you know, the, the, all of this does depend on what the margin of victory is. If you ask any of the lawyers, in Bush versus Gore, what the most important factor was over that month long period in December and, and November 2000, it was looking at the bottom of the TV screen and seeing how many votes separated the two candidates. And so we haven't even gotten there yet, right? There are still millions of votes that need to be counted. Once those votes are counted and that will happen in the next 48 hours, then we'll have a better idea as to uh, what the legal arguments might be. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question about the, the allegations of 300,000 missing ballots that seem to not just be coming from the right, but are on you know, USA Today, uh, talking about the Postal Service's uh, concerns there about needing to locate these ballots. Uh, any, anything, any thoughts on these headlines? So there was an additional and kind of unique legal action that was brought um, in uh, DC with Judge Emmett Sullivan on postal the, against the US Postal Service and to make sure that they um, delivered the ballots on time. They refused yesterday during the day to do the sweep that, that he had 
off and he had asked them to do, or at least they delayed it, um, in order to look for absentee ballots in the relevant postal facilities. Um, that could be relevant um, if those ballots are outcome determinative in some places. Um, I think we don't really know yet um, what the situation is there. If it's if these are Pennsylvania ballots, right, then if they get gathered in the next uh, two days, then they could potentially be part of that group of segregated ballots that will be uh, dealt with later. Um, and it's, it's hard to know how many of those ballots might have an effect in places like Michigan, Nevada, uh, and, and the like. Um, uh, North Carolina, for example, could have ballots uh, received many days after now because the, each state has different rules as to whether they stop the count um, on election day, not stop the count, but they, they stop receiving ballots on election day or whether they extend it out. And so um, it really just depends on what the margin of victory is. Great, thank you. And then uh, another question that actually takes us a little bit further upstream to the question of money and politics and likens this conversation here to sort of the autopsy, we're at the back end of the elections, but I know you and I actually have done a lot of work together over the years around the role of money in politics. I think the 2016 elections, we saw something like $7 billion uh, uh, in, injected into the election cycle. And this year, it's looking to be closer to $11 billion. So uh, a question about what can be done to address those concerns further upstream. And my short answer is not a lot given the long Supreme Court history here, but I'm curious what, what your thoughts are. Well, it really does depend on what we think the problem is. Um, the amount of money in the system is not necessarily a problem, right? I mean, you might think that it should be spent on better uses, <laughs> um, but our democracy is a pretty important use uh, for that. Um, I'm, you know, I, of course, am supportive of public funding uh, and think it would be much better, but, but generous public funding so that the amount of money wouldn't necessarily be affected, but the source, right? So you worry about people who are spending money that then have undue influence over office holders' judgment and the like. Um, but the, you know, the, it doesn't seem like the amount of money that was spent um, itself had an appreciable uh, effect on results. Uh, it just means that, you know, both, both candidates, at least at the presidential level, were well-funded uh, and, and were able to spend as much money on, on political communication and mobilization as they wanted. Um, but I do think that the fundamentals of this election, right, were what predicted the outcomes. Um, and I think that, you know, the, um, the, the, we're a very divided and equally divided country. And that's been clear uh, for a while. And now it's been uh, really made clear by this election. Yeah, thank you. And I think this point you make about the source being more, much more important than the amount is, is a really important one that is sometimes uh, lost track of. So um, we have some other questions that are really uh, related to uh, disinformation. So I wanted to now, uh, in the interest of time, turn to our next uh, panel, and then we'll have more time for questions at the end uh, with, uh, with Nate when we get there. But Alex, uh, welcome, and Renee. Uh, so Alex and Renee lead the Stanford Internet Observatory. On September 8th, you both uh, launched the Election Integrity Project together with Graphica, the DFR Lab, and the University of Washington that was really designed to help surface and respond to election-related misinformation in real time. This was a Herculean effort to staff up a war room that has been operating around the clock and done really tremendous work in examining the trends and content that we are seeing. And I think this year it sounds like much more around incitements to violence and allegations of fraud than we had seen in the 2016 elections. Their team has done remarkable work looking at who the main actors are behind this. And uh, spoiler alert, but apparently not as much Russian troll activity this year and instead uh, more uh, from verified influencers. Uh, I think you have also started to talk about new techniques that you're seeing, more concerns around live streaming uh, since George Floyd. So really an incredible amount of work tracking that and also uh, beyond just tracking the disinformation, tracking how platforms have been responding to this with, uh, with policies that are changing uh, week by week, sometimes day by day. Um, if we can put up in the chat, there has been a, a great analysis of policies uh, comparing Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. I think you also had Nextdoor and TikTok and Twitch in there. Um, and also looking at how the platforms have in many instances been failing to moderate content well that isn't in English. So um, this team has done an incredible amount of work. Would love to turn to you guys for 10 or 15 minutes 
of comment uh, in particular on, on what we saw in terms of disinformation themes and actors and techniques. Um, any big surprises that, that you have observed and, and your sense of what we should be expecting in the coming weeks. Uh, so I don't know if Alex, you want to start and then turn to Renee. Yeah, uh, and we've got some slides because uh, most of this disinformation Perfect. is a visual thing. Um, uh, so we thought we would share with everybody. Um, and folks sorry. can just enter questions in the Q&A, by the way, and again, and we'll go ahead and, and get to those uh, once you guys have gone through. There we go. So like Kelly said, uh, here at the Internet Observatory, part of the Cyber Policy Center, uh, we've been, we pulled together this partnership from these four different institutions. Overall, we had about 120 people working on this project. About half of those came from Stanford. That included 30 new hires. So we hired 30 undergraduate and graduate students uh, to help with this work um, and train them up in doing open source investigation of disinformation uh, and have been working uh, at least for the last week. Uh, well, we've been operating since the beginning of September and we've been slowly ramping up and over the last week have been operating 20 hours a day. So we, we've had five, four hour shifts starting at 4 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and going to past midnight last night. Uh, and, uh, you know, Renee and I are totally uh, lucid um, and are doing great, right, Renee? Um, yeah, no problem. Uh, so anyway, uh, give you a quick overview of some of the stuff we saw. So uh, if you go to EI, we're only gonna be able to do a tiny little bit. Like all those people are putting out a lot of content. If you go to eipartnership.net, our front page has been turned into a live blog. Also, our Twitter account is very active, 2020 Partnership. Um, if you go to eipartnership.net, you'll find that we had, before the election, we wrote a piece of, you know, from all of the pre-election disinformation that we had, looked at what our expectations were on election day immediately afterwards and in the days afterwards. Um, and I think this actually has held up pretty well. Um, these are some of the challenges we are looking for on election day and how they would express themselves in online disinformation. Um, here are a couple examples. So first off, it was a very interesting regional focus, right? So the disinformation we saw was not equally distributed across the country at any time during the day. Um, and certainly, especially in the beginning, in the middle of the day, there's a huge focus on Pennsylvania. I guess with the expectation uh, that Pennsylvania would be uh, a critical swing state. And what we saw is both the creation of completely false narratives. So there on the left is an example of uh, a person who uh, put a Instagram story up. So this is a kind of a temporary thing that a small number of people generally see he didn't have a lot of followers, um, saying that he was a poll worker in Erie, Pennsylvania, and that he had thrown away hundreds of ballots for, for Donald Trump. Um, that was screenshotted and then passed around first on Twitter and got tens of thousands of, of likes and retweets from a number of different, uh, and so you know, hundreds of thousands of people saw this and then it made it way back to Instagram as a screenshot. Uh, this helped demonstrate a theory that we had going into this, which is that uh, a lot of this disinformation would be cross-platform. And so, you know, one of our areas is we have we have this full-time war room um, that can take tips and find things. And one of the differences between us and the people who are doing this work inside of the companies is we explicitly work across platforms uh, because uh, we're not tied to any specific one. And so this is a great example of something we had to chase down on multiple platforms. Um, we reached out, we contacted via our partners at the Election Integrity ISAC. We contacted the uh, election officials in Erie, Pennsylvania. They confirmed, uh, and as well as people at the state level in Pennsylvania, that this person wasn't even a poll worker. He wasn't a volunteer. Um, also, the things he was saying was just would be completely impossible to get away with. You can't just grab the the ballots that have been cast for one candidate and go throw them away and get away with it. Um, and so uh, they confirmed that we were able to go back to the platforms, get it pulled down, uh, and then trigger some counter messaging. On the right is something else that we saw a lot of, which is, uh, as Nate talks about, elections are really complicated. A lot of election officials did a really incredible job dealing with very difficult circumstances yesterday. Um, but you will still have broken machines. You'll have ballots that are misprinted. You will have long lines. Um, you'll have things that are normal parts of election administration that look weird. And one of those things is that you have people in just normal Jeep Cherokees driving around and picking up ballot boxes and taking them to the proper centers. Now there are systems to track where the ballots are, who voted to make sure nothing gets lost. Um, this is an example of a picture that was taken of somebody uh, who turns out was authorized, was allowed to do this, uh, did nothing wrong, um, but trying to spin this as a, a big scandal that somebody was picking up a ballot box. This also demonstrates another trend that we saw yesterday, which is we see the same repeat offender. So the, the Philly GOP account, which claims to be part of the Philadelphia Republican Party, um, that, that's not a verified account, so we're not totally sure who runs it. The Philly GOP account would be an example of a Twitter account we saw over and over and over again in a bunch of different, different disinformation examples. Um, 
And uh, while these, th this tweet was specifically taken down, equivalent uh, uh, claims were taken down from Facebook, um, some of these accounts that had large followings uh, and or seemed like official outlets of the political parties or of the candidates were not punished for their repeat transgressions uh, and violating of the policies. Um, and so we saw this, this real big focus on Pennsylvania, um, as well as the same people over and over again, kind of spinning things. Anything you want to add there, Renee? I think um, one other thing I would add to that is that there was a lot of these pipelines whereby the, a particular Twitter account that was being followed, such as the Philly GOP account, was then pushed out to uh, Parlay or Parler, one of the kind of smaller conservative social networks that focuses exclusively on conservatives. And then once it makes its way into that, uh, you know, echo chamber group of people who are really very much inclined to believe it, those people in turn take it and push it out using to their followings with their, uh, you know, their channels on a number of different platforms. We would see things hop from Twitter to Telegram and Parlay. Uh, and the same narratives would be spreading across a variety of platforms all at once. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the the multi-platform stuff was big. And, and again, these are platforms that didn't exist in 2016, right? So that was a big difference is that you have the Gab vote, Parler, Parlay. We're still arguing over whether people on an alt-right site would use the French pronunciation. Um, we'll see if that sticks or not. Um, uh, another platform that didn't exist in 2016 was TikTok. Uh, TikTok is very, very popular with young people. Uh, and uh, we saw a lot of interesting disinformation on it about the election. To their credit, the TikTok uh, team was extremely receptive. Um, and so that was uh, actually like a real positive thing that happened. Something that was a little less positive in TikTok is what we saw uh, a, a bunch of uh, memes about the possibility uh, that specifically if Joe Biden won, that there would be mass murders of people in the LGBTQ or people of color. Um, and uh, this was, you know, in some cases they were referring to kind of secret documents and like that were never really pointed to. Uh, but this became a meme that a lot of people shared because they really didn't believe it. Uh, and then it made its way to Twitter. Uh, but as you can see, like this specific one had very high engagement, uh, 278,000 likes, 10,000 comments. Um, and so, you know, some of the stuff on TikTok can go viral very, very aggressively, uh, depending on how the algorithm's working. Um, and eventually TikTok did take care of this. Um, but these kinds of memes of people who really do believe that there's a potential of violence or something, but then cause a bunch of panic uh, or cite evidence that doesn't exist are a difficult problem for the companies. We also saw a bunch of live streams. Um, and this is a, an interesting, you know, uh, a, something that has, is different of the social media environment this year uh, from 2016 is the, the explosion of live streams, uh, especially on YouTube. And one of the interesting things that's happened is that if you go through YouTube, what you'll find is that there are effectively alternative cable networks that are for people for whom uh, MSNBC on the left or Fox on the right are not radical enough. Um, and so you have these cable outlets that are very, very partisan that have pretty high production values. Like in 2020, turns out you don't have to have tens of millions of dollars and people in 30 Rockefeller Center uh, to produce something that looks like a, a high quality uh, cable channel. Um, and so they'll sometimes have like pretty high production values, uh, but at very, very low costs and uh, will push really, really radical content. Um, and some of these channels have hundreds of thousands to millions of viewers, like a significant fraction of the actual cable networks. Uh, you know, this is not an example of that. We also saw live streams where people were trying to um, sell the idea that there was widespread violence across the United States. Um, this was from a prominent game streamer with 500,000 followers who seemed to be doing it just to get more attention and get more followers. Um, but uh, this person repurposed a bunch of videos of protests from around the country over the last couple of years and then was replaying them in loops saying that these these were live videos of people. And if you watch the comments, people really did, did believe that this was going on in cities across the country. Eventually, YouTube took this down but I think we're going to continue to see live stream content as being problematic. Um, we saw some in incitement to violence related to that um, and, and people, you know, trying to position, in some cases, incidents that really happened or conflicts that happened and trying to turn it into a much bigger deal, um, as well as, uh, you know, the creation like here on the right uh, is from a, a really nasty uh, bulletin board where people are trying to create the idea that ballots are being burned um, and then uh, asking people to become poll watchers. This did not play out uh, significantly with significant outcomes of violence. So that, that is a good thing. Um, and so talk about where we are now, right? So election day is over. We're now kind of in this post-election uncertainty and moving over to um, the red waves and blue shift uh, time. Um, the election violence narratives got limited traction. Anything you want to add here, Renee? Uh, you know, I, I was a little bit surprised that, that this didn't play out that well. Um, what would you think about what happened to the violence narratives? 
I think that there was a lot of content early in the day um, creating the perception that there was going to be violence. So there was the stuff that Alex alluded to with regard to the TikTok videos. Uh, then we also saw um, high profile influencers speculating darkly at what would happen if a certain district or area was called because they so sincerely believed that it belonged to their candidate. Um, we saw, uh, interestingly, uh, RT, Russia, you know, formerly Russia Today, dropped a documentary um, about where they went and interviewed Boogaloo Boys and Antifa uh, and, you know, asked them kind of just asking questions approach to why do you think you need weapons, I believe, you know, following election day, we're very concerned about this, um, you know, so that that kind of uh, state state sponsored propaganda, again, creating the impression that uh, there was going to be violence in the streets. And this was something that, uh, you know, America was burning. Um, one of the things that we do see is uh, some of the streams that make it to Facebook are actually from users that are aggregating a number of different streams on Twitch. So people who are in one of the various cities where there's a potential for some sort of activity or action are at the protest, they're streaming from uh, from their local perspective. Uh, and then a channel on Facebook will pick the most sensational or active or, um, you know, tense moment from the litany of Twitch streams and will push that out. And so again, that kind of creates the perception that there is this sort of constant siege in which, you know, something terrible is happening somewhere in America at all times. So that dynamic is interesting too, in which the ways in which these two, um, again, cross-platform type dynamics are happening. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, here's the another theme that started to be pushed last night uh, is the idea that the blue shift, which as Nate talked about, uh, the, the idea that uh, mail-in ballots, especially in the states uh, where the legislature does not allow them to start processing ballots before election day, was likely to shift towards the Democratic side, that that is being seen as something malicious um, uh, or fraudulent. Uh, and so this is the big theme that is being pushed uh, today uh, by a variety of sources. As you'll see here, uh, though, like on the Sean Davis account, um, you know, Twitter has uh, labeled this. Uh, we, we've seen pretty widespread labeling um, from both Facebook and Twitter. The interesting thing is that a huge amount of this is being driven, and we've seen this over the last several months, by known influencers. Right, so we're not talking about uh, misinformation that comes from the grassroots. We're not talking about foreign interference. We're talking about confirmed influencers who we know exactly who they are, who have very large follower accounts, who are able to drive these ideas. And because they are not punished for being labeled over and over and over again, there is no downside. And in fact, they seem to enjoy being suppressed by the big tech companies because this has become a part of their brand now. I am so dangerous that, that Twitter and Facebook won't let me speak. Um, and so there, there does seem to be, well, I think it is important for the companies to continue to label. There is some paradoxical blowback here um, and the possibility that uh, you know, they're going, there's going to need to be much more aggressive enforcement of rules against repeat offenders if you're going to change the calculus of whether it's worth it or not to break platform rules um, and to claim fraud that doesn't exist. Another thing that keeps on happening is the narratives are, ch are chasing uh, the states based upon what happens politically and with the electoral college count. Um, here is a theme that we saw first emerge in Chicago. And apparently this actually happened. Uh, people were uh, in some places, they're voting in Chicago with Sharpie pens on paper. And there are folks saying, oh, this bleeds through and I don't think it's going to get read and stuff like that. Chicago Board of Elections came out and said, no, it's not a problem. People vote with Sharpies all the time. This isn't a big deal. Um, but then that gets picked up and then talked about in Connecticut and then in Arizona at early in the morning Eastern time after Fox News had called Arizona for Vice President Biden. I mean, that was very controversial. Nobody else had called it. All of a sudden, we see a bunch of the disinformation narratives that had been focused on Pennsylvania and other states that were considered to be the critical swing states swing over to Arizona. And you see this exact same idea that handing out Sharpies or handing out pencils, you know, depending on what writing instrument you're using, that's part of a vast conspiracy, all of a sudden get repurposed for the, the hot state at that moment. And so this is what we expect is going to happen over the next couple of days, is that as the as the legal system evolves, and as you have lawsuits and other important things happening in different states, the disinformation actors are going to chase the ball um, to wherever is at that moment. And so we'll see the same narratives that have been injected over the last couple of days recycled over and over again. Renee, you want to talk a little bit more about what we're expecting in the next couple of days? Yeah, so the team is still actively working and my Slack is exploding <laughs> on the other, you know, the bottom of the screen here. Um, so there's a ton of stuff still going on. Um, 
some of the uh, concerns that we articulated in some of our posts prior to election day have in fact manifested. Um, right now, what we're seeing a lot of is repurposing of content from election day to bolster claims of fraud and illegitimacy. So that is the first person, um, you know, taken by real people, the kind of uh, context free screen um, clip, uh, photo or video is then in uh, kind of being, these stories are being aggregated into broader narratives, alleging fraud and illegitimacy in certain areas. So that's the thing that we expected to have to deal with. And in fact, that's happening. So we're seeing old instances, things that were debunked or uh, addressed sometimes even as far as a week ago are kind of, uh, you know, regaining traction and popping up again. Um, Alex, I think alluded to number two here, dis and misinformation will continue to move geographically. So as various states become the focus of the nation's attention on uh, who is going to get those electoral votes, we're going to see the misinformation narratives, again, kind of swing in that direction to, uh, to kind of cast doubt on the legitimacy of the claim to those votes. And then finally, I think one of the uh, other areas that we articulated leading into the election was ways in which pre-delegitimization narratives, very kind of big word, but what we meant by that was um, preemptively uh, casting doubt on the validity of the election by creating a kind of conspiratorial frame in which things could be read. So one of the more notorious of these was the claim that there was going to be a color revolution, uh, which is uh, you know, originally referred to kind of student-led popular protests to overthrow uh, authoritarian and semi-authoritarian governments, which was then recast by Russia and China over the years to mean, um, to, to, to delegitimize those very legitimate student and popular-led actions uh, to claim that they had in fact been precipitated by the American CIA. And so the narrative that we saw here, we wrote a post about it, documenting ways in which uh, the idea that there was going to be a coup, there was going to be a color revolution to steal victory from the president, um, which was facilitated by the Democrats and the American deep state. This was the theory as it was as it was presented repeatedly on numerous channels. We did begin to see as results came in, and there was some, uh, you know, as the president made his his speech saying that that the election was being stolen from him. We did begin to see tweets and Facebook posts go up saying, "Remember, they warned us about the color revolution." And so again, the groundwork that had been laid, those delegitimization claims that were. Uh, that began to be part of the framing for certain media environments who trust the media personalities that were saying them, began to hear that theme back in August and September. And of course, as, as it was kind of consistently reinforced, again, began to, uh, to pick it up and use it last night, which was uh, in fact the entire point. So I think those are the, the three things and probably makes sense to get to Q&A. Great, thank you both so much. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Um, I am gonna start actually kind of at the end of our question train because there have been quite a few at, about how the platforms handled disinformation this cycle. Um, and so first, and I would talk about maybe three main themes around these platform questions. One is what are the new and sort of up and coming platforms? Do we see any differences in the sort of age or demographics of who is using those platforms? I know you've talked about Twitch some, you didn't yet speak about BitChute, but I know there's been, and, par and Parlay as well, of course. And so a, a bucket of questions around what are the new platforms doing and how do they compare in terms of their moderation practices? Um, and then a second group of questions around um, the kinds of controls or practices that these platforms have used. Are they allowing different user controls? How have their policies differed? You know, we saw Twitter banning political ads more than a year ago, I think, and then it was only, I guess, a week or two ago that Facebook uh, and Google came out and said they won't have new ads, you know, after the elections. Uh, and, and so questions around um, how uniform are these rules around labeling and otherwise, and should they be uniform? Uh, so we'll start there, and then there's two or three other questions after that. Uh, so, I mean, on the labeling, I think, um, you know, the Labeling is a reasonable solution uh, in most cases instead of taking stuff down. Um, I think that's especially true when you're talking about the pronouncements of a Democratic candidate themselves. I think actually there's um, a little too much focus on the labeling of things that the President of the United States actually says because everything he says uh, is newsworthy. You know, he gave a speech last night in which he prematurely claimed victory and it was full of disinformation, his speech. Um, it was carried live on every network. Uh, only NBC broke in to actually uh, counter program. I saw on local TV this morning uh, that uh, at least two of the stations I looked at were carrying that speech as kind of a both sides issue. Um, and so I think we gotta be, one, it's like a very 
diff difficult place to be and I think a dangerous place to say we want to solve the problem of candidates and democratic elections through incredibly powerful trillion dollar companies that are the information intermediaries. Like the actual speech of candidates, that's a difficult thing for, that's a dangerous thing for them to get involved with. It is also the place where they have the least impact because um, thousands of articles have been said, written about the things that he said, and it's being played over and over again, clips all over. Um, where it's more important for the labeling uh, or for content to be taken down is then, you know, if the president says something that's not true, what we see then is this cascade effect where you have tons and tons of different actors now try to reinforce that theme via the ejection of evidence that isn't true. And that is where the companies can actually kind of hold back the tide and keep there from the, the creation of a conventional wisdom that's not based upon reality and fact. Um, uh, Twitter's labels are much more aggressive in that they actually stop sharing. And I think that's an appropriate thing. Um, uh, I also like the fact that both companies are now doing kind of pre-bunking. So if you open up Instagram or Facebook today, you'll get a little banner that says the election hasn't been decided yet, uh, which I think is also an uh, acknowledgement of the fact that if on either, either platform, your conversation is likely to be dominated about the election. And so they can't just label everything as kind of true, mostly true, somewhat, somewhat true. Um, and so putting the, the authoritative information up top and kind of preparing people for the fact that they're uncertainly, they're certainly going to see information that's probably not totally true is, is a reasonable way to handle it. Uh, Renee, thoughts on this? Are there also questions around you know, how did TikTok perform this year um, and, and questions around sort of user controls, the ability for people to share evidence uh, on like, you know, different ways that users can kind of get involved in, uh, in addressing disinformation? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think uh, as far as the emergence of new platforms, this is something that researchers were very interested in how that was going to manifest following the, uh, the understanding of things like the Russian inter uh, interference campaigns in um, <clears throat> excuse me, 2016, which kind of focused on three major platforms. Uh, there was a lot of debate about the extent to which the challenge of audience consolidation, the problem of everybody being on three platforms meant that uh, adversaries and people who wanted to achieve a, a degree of influence only had to really focus their efforts on three platforms. Um, what we did see with the emergence of the new platforms over the last four years, the in kind of the, the play space change, so to speak. Uh, you did have TikTok, you had Parlay, you had a number of kind of uh, niche platforms that began to focus on particular demographics, platforms that began to declare themselves to be the free speech alternative to uh, the, major, the major companies. So all of a sudden the, um, the environment expanded. What we did see is that uh, moderation resources require, you know, significant effort and, and outlay and careful thought. And so some of the smaller platforms, I think, did have a, you know, bit of a um, need to really ramp up quite quickly, given the stakes of the 2020 election. Um, as far as user reporting, at times, you know, it's it's hard to know what to report as. So we did see the sort of uh, emergence of vast new menus on the large platforms uh, that allowed users to try to flag content and, uh, and try to say, hey, this, this appeared in my feed. I don't think this is legitimate. I think this needs additional eyes. Uh, the challenge is, again, when you kind of um, put that into the user's hands, the challenge for the platform is then triaging the vast um, collection of reports that they actually do get. And so one of the things that we tried to do at EIP was keep track of where all of these things were and then work together through our four institutions in the partnership and then the civil society and, and platform partners that we had to try to level up the most significant things, not a piece of misinformation that was a sort of tree falling in the woods with four likes, but here is an example of something that is beginning to take shape, that is beginning to hop from platform to platform, where the velocity is increasing, uh, where the virality is significant, and you know, to kind of triage more effectively, to kind of help triage alongside uh, the tech platforms and user reporters as well. Great, thank you. So I'm going to bucket a whole bunch of questions into two final ones, uh, and then we'll move over to other panelists and we'll have more time for Q&A here at the very end. Um, so there was a whole set of questions around the Latino community. How much disinformation did we see targeted at them? What platforms, you know, do we have any experience around WhatsApp on that front? And then how did the platforms do in managing content in other languages? So we had, uh 
teams looking at other languages. We are specifically focused on Spanish and Chinese because those are places, uh, uh, communities that we had seen targeted by disinformation in the run-up uh, to the election. Um, in neither case did we see anything that differed significantly from the general kind of theme. So we see the same kind of ideas that we see in English. Um, th there is an interesting question about WhatsApp uh, of whether especially the Latino community um, is using WhatsApp in a way that creates, uh, you know, there, in other countries, we've had democratic elections where there's been disinformation that's much more peer-to-peer, -peer, specifically India and Brazil, because of the deep penetration of, of WhatsApp. Uh, and so it is possible that that played a role. This is where this gets really complicated because WhatsApp is encrypted end-to-end -end. that provides a huge amount of privacy for the billions of people that use the, the product. Uh, it also makes it very difficult to track disinformation both by us and by the company itself. Uh, and uh, this is actually an area of focus of ours. After the election, we're gonna be holding another set of discussions around balancing safety and security and privacy on end -to encrypted apps. Uh, there are some potential you know, uh, uh, ways to address some of these issues, but for the most part, this is gonna be a hard trade-off that we're, if we're gonna provide people with the ability to have uh, private conversations with small groups of one another, then you will also provide the ability for disinformation to spread. Right now though, there's no good empirical evidence of WhatsApp playing a big role. Great. Um, any other thoughts, Renee, on the, the question of Latinos or the another question that came in was less about who was being targeted, but who was behind uh, the disinformation this time. And so I'll group two or three questions which talk about what about Russia, what about other foreign actors, what about QAnon, my sense from your comments uh, over the last few weeks has been that what we're seeing now really is domestically generated disinformation from authentic verified influencer accounts, but what did we see from foreign actors? What did we see from Q or other groups that we might be concerned about? Sure, so mostly it was state media narratives. Uh, again, you know, Russia and Iran and, and China and everyone else have their um, have their their bots, but the, none of that really seemed to be a significant force this time around. What they do also have though is their state media, right? They're very very large audiences on state media, and their ability to just create propaganda narratives that are appealing to some segment of the population. What we've been seeing, kind of anecdotally, but it's a research question of ours right now from Russia, is actually an interesting segmentation in which RT kind of takes one side and Redfish and some of the other kind of linked properties take the other. So you'll see RT push out a narrative about protest movements and they focus very, very, uh, you know, they focused much less on the election and ballot related things and much more heavily on the threat of violence and racism and protest movements. And so that was sort of where that, uh, that activity tended to stay. Um, what we saw there was, again, uh, RT taking one kind of editorial stance and Redfish taking the other. Redfish is often very, very kind of pro-protester. Um, and then we see Iran come in and, again, uh, will amplify what Russia has put out. So there's always that kind of pipeline in which it goes from one state media to, to an aligned state media. Uh, and then kind of, again, layering in their theories uh, atop it, which uh, from Iran is very, again, they've put out a number of uh, pro-Black Lives Matter information operations in recent months, sometimes covert, sometimes overt, uh, in which they express support for protesters and, you know, sort of bemoan the sorry state of American racial relations. And so that is a um, kind of, again, a narrative. But none of that, you know, in the media environments in which those are trusted sources, they are, of course, received. And, and RT as a channel does have um, American personalities act as broadcasters. They do lives, they discuss election results. So there is, you know, if you are immersed in that media ecosystem, you are seeing that particular um, that particular alignment. It's, it's just out there, but it's not covert. It's not like the Internet Research Agency segmentation of American society, creation of fake personas, agents of influence, et cetera, et cetera, the kind of uh, dark propaganda um, activities of years past. Great, thank you. Well, I would love to come back to you guys and Nate at the end to just talk about what were the biggest surprises that came up for you this, this year um, or this election season, but now would love to turn to our colleague, Andy Grotto. Uh, Andy, as I said, uh, leads the, the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance here. Andy was hoping you could take just five minutes to walk us through, in particular, a project that you started, I think it was back in January with Janine Zakaria, working with newsrooms across the country to develop a toolkit for how to report responsibly on hacks and disinformation. And I think that was picked up by the Washington Post and others as, as their sort of practice for this election cycle. So would love to get your preliminary take 
on how you think that credible fact-based news organizations did covering hack and leak and other manipulations and what you're thinking about in terms of the risks ahead. Great. Uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, and thank you all for, uh, for joining us uh, this morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where, where you are. So yeah, so I want to offer a, a progress report on how uh, credible uh, fact-based news organizations have fared uh, in covering uh, disinformation, hacking leaks, and other propaganda campaigns so far. Uh, I'm going to drop um, a, uh, a link to the report that uh, Kelly mentioned in the chat so that um, you, know, you all can, can grab it. Um, there it is. So, um, so what do I mean by credible fact-based news organizations? Um, I mean, in essence, the, the majors that, that, that set the tone, uh, the national tone for news, so in print, that's in places like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, just to name a few, uh, in broadcast, um, that's outlets like NBC, ABC, CNN, PBS, again, just to name a few. And of course, uh, regional papers um, that abide by comparable uh, standards. Uh, my assessment is that it's too early uh, to offer a final grade for 2020, uh, both because the election is still ongoing, but also because I don't think uh, credible fact-based news organizations have faced any major tests yet, notwithstanding uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, and I will come back to that. Uh, so you might ask, does, you know, does lamestream media still even matter in this era of social media? And the answer is emphatically yes. Um, so ideally, uh, candidates and other uh, leading public figures would, would come together uh, to denounce disinformation and other propaganda operations in a bipartisan uh, affirmation uh, of the integrity of our civil discourse. That ain't happening, uh, which means that social media and news organizations more or less are, are more or less uh, alone um, as frontline uh, defenders. Um, we just heard a lot from uh, Alex and Renee on, on their work focused on social media. Uh, credible uh, fact-based news organizations also play a, a vitally important role in, um, in civic discourse, uh, to, to put it uh, mildly. Um, they can also unwittingly support propaganda uh, campaigns by lifting uh, conspiracy theories, falsehoods, and half-truths uh, from social media and exposing them to a broader audience, even when the news organization's goal is to debunk the false or misleading content. Uh, the good news is that reporters uh, now have a variety of resources they can turn to uh, for how to cover uh, propaganda in a, in a responsible way. Uh, Jeanine Zakari and I have written on this. Um, that, that's the link you see in chat. Uh, and, and organizations like First Draft, the American Press Institute, and others have, have developed really good materials as well. Um, now, news organizations face particular challenges when dealing with a hack and leak scenarios. Uh, especially when there's reason to believe that uh, the perpetrators of the hack and leak are trying to advance uh, a propaganda campaign. Uh, ever since uh, Daniel Ellsberg's 1971 leak of the Pentagon Papers, journalists have generally operated under a single rule. Once uh, information is authenticated, uh, if it's newsworthy, you run with it, you publish it. Uh, how it was obtained um, is of secondary concern to the authenticated information itself. Uh, in this new area, Janine and I have argued that journalists uh, must abandon this principle in favor of updated norms. Uh, news organizations won't and shouldn't ignore stolen information if it's newsworthy, uh, but they need to make the provenance of the material an essential part of the story so that readers understand why and who hacked it. Uh, this was a major problem in 2016 when uh, reporters engaged in that feeding frenzy around the leaked DNC emails. Uh, focusing uh, primarily on what the emails revealed about, you know, things like Hillary Clinton's paid speeches, uh, John Podesta's risotto recipe, uh, rather than on the real news, which is that Russia stole those emails and leaked them in order to help uh, Trump win. So for, from this perspective, um, I think the Hunter Biden laptop leak was actually a relatively easy case for credible fact-based news organizations. Uh, many news organizations passed on covering the story because the materials couldn't be authenticated as really being authored or created by Hunter Biden. And on top of that, the content itself uh, wasn't particularly newsworthy. There was no evidence, for example, in the content uh, that, that Vice President Biden did anything inappropriate. So while I think uh, credible news organizations generally handle this case appropriately, I don't think it presented that big of a test for them uh, in the same way DNC emails did in 2016. 
Um, Renee and Alex uh, laid out a bunch of memes uh, and campaigns on social media, you know, falsely alleging fraud, violence, and, and, and other disinformation and misinformation. I think it's noteworthy and, and good news so far that the majors uh, have tended to address these memes not by reporting on the memes, uh, but through pre-bunking, pre truth sandwiches, and other techniques designed to um, you know, get, get help, help, help uh, um, readers and viewers um, get, get to ground truth. Uh, and my preliminary analysis of local and regional newspapers, um, outlets such as you know, the Detroit Free Press, uh, the New Hampshire Union Leader, uh, shows a similar level of responsibility. Uh, but we have a long way to go still, uh, and I will stop there. Great, Andy, thanks so much. And for those who have questions for Andy, I know there are already a couple in the chat box. And um, please go ahead and put those in now. We're gonna wait and do a fuller Q&A after we hear from Maricha and Rob. Uh, so Maricha, I would love to turn to you now in Europe. Um, I know that you taught a class with Rob actually that just wrapped on technology and the 2020 elections, how Silicon Valley technologies affect elections and shape uh, democracy. And I think we can probably share some links to the policy briefs coming out of, of that course, but would love to just get your sense on learnings from that, um, your sort of European perspective on the elections in the United States and the sort of future challenges and opportunities in tech governance, uh, generally given your experience in Parliament. Thanks so much, Kelly. And I wanted to begin by expressing my admiration for the relentless work done by Nate, Renee, and Alex, uh, as well as their teams of the Healthy Elections Project and the Election Integrity Partnership. Um, I think as colleagues, and I hope many, many of you also did, we saw how you spent the last months with razor sharp focus and dedication, uh, helped by uh, an army of students to ensure that no malign activities or confusions could derail the democratic process for the American people. And I, I think that was just really inspiring. Um, now, shifting perspective from Europe, where I am, uh, also because of the executive order, um, people here too are eagerly tuning into US media and they, uh, of course, await and respect the process towards the definitive outcome. But uh, if you didn't sleep so much, I think many Europeans have had a short nights here as well because who leads the United States matters for the rest of the world. Um, polls, to the extent that they will ever be trusted again, uh, here suggest that the vast majority of European citizens, if they could vote in the United States, would have overwhelmingly supported the Democratic Party and candidates. Uh, and my sense, and also in talking to friends and, and people uh, in my wider network here, reading the media, my sense is that for many people here, it is not easy to quite understand how much support President Trump has, despite, for example, the controversial approach to the COVID pandemic, but also uh, his very provocative rhetoric and his dealings with the rest of the world. Um, I imagine that many Democratic leaders and allies are longing for a return to a more predictable U.S. administration, that is more supportive of international cooperation on a number of topics ranging from climate change, trade, peace and security, but also tech governance or human rights. Um, the attacks on democracy and the democratic process that we've already seen, including today, uh, when the president challenged the electoral process that actually happened on his watch, uh, did not go unseen in the rest of the world. And I think especially previous attacks on the press on women, on immigrants, but also on leaders of other countries and on international cooperation have led to growing concerns about the ability to maintain transatlantic relationship and other alliances in the way that it has been. Uh, despite ups and downs in the transatlantic relation, I think that's undeniable, but uh, without such an adversarial approach. And I think that across the world, leaders have taken notice including those who wish to dethrone the United States. And they've seen the divisions, the polarization, and have observed that significant amounts of Americans don't quite mind when their leader disrespects democracy. And I fear that that will impact the US's ability to support democracy elsewhere, whether it's online or offline, and that that will be a credibility and power problem, no matter who the next president is. Um, we saw predictable, cynical, but a tweet of the leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran already kind of mocking uh, the process. 
So in many ways, my sense is that Trump's imprint on these elections, on the United States and its position in the world will, will outlast uh, his presidency if he is not uh, staying on for a second term. And with narrow margins, even if Joe Biden wins, uh, a lot of attention will be needed at home to heal a divided country. Uh, we know Biden's legacy and history in foreign policy, and I'm sure that the tone will change immediately. But whether he can get nominees through the Senate or the support to prioritize focus back on the Paris Climate Agreement, the Iran nuclear deal, membership of the World Health Organization, of UNESCO, et cetera, uh, the question will remain, I think, in the eyes of partners, how reliable uh, the United States will be perceived to be after withdrawals out of all these agreements. So even if Biden wins, the record that Trump has set uh, will, I believe, cast a shadow, and that shadow won't evaporate overnight. So I'll leave it at that in order to have uh, time for Q&A. Thanks for, um, for having me. Thanks, Maricha. And Rob, uh, I'd like to turn to you. You co-taught this class with Maricha on tech in the 2020 elections. You have been teaching a class and writing a book on tech ethics and obviously have been commenting on the state of U.S. democracy for some time. So would love uh, to hear your thoughts on all of that. Great. I'm also going to be brief uh, because I'd love to get, get the whole batch of us here talking with each other and answering some questions. Um, I'm going to use just a few minutes to say that I bring to the table the perspective of someone who's a political philosopher. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the 30,000 foot you know, um, perspective here, not the, the micro level. And so that sets me apart a bit. So I've got two questions I just want to insert into the conversation and then one big picture observation. Uh, and, and then hopefully we'll open it up to everybody. So the two questions are um, directed chiefly at, at Nate and, and his colleagues and the work with the Healthy Elections Project, and then to um, Alex and, and Renee and their work on the Elections Integrity Partnership along with their colleagues. So uh, for Nate, um, and given your past experience, I'm curious to know in the longer run, um, does the experience of this election and the rise in the number of absentee and mail-in ballots um, pose for us greater challenges in the future about electoral administration that we need to correct in the United States? And part of what I have in mind here in asking this is, um, did the pivot to mail-in ballots create the frame for the current president um, to, to um, um, claim that by waiting to count ballots after the election, um, it was a, um, an opportunity uh, for him to, to, you know, an open door for him to walk through. Um, how can we do better in the future so that we're not counting ballots um, 10 days after the election? Um, and what type of administrative changes do we need? For Alex and Renee, um, the Election Integrity uh, Partnership is, has been um, extraordinary. And I'm curious to know whether you see this as a model for a way to help regulate the political function of the social media platforms in the future. Or um, is it impossible to scale and sustain the kind of effort that you've done heroically over the course of the past um, few, few months? Can you imagine that the partnership would be a, a global partnership um, handling social media misinformation, disinformation um, around electoral issues across the world? Um, do you imagine this being a kind of civil society way of governing and regulating the platforms? Okay, and with that, I'm just gonna make one big picture observation. By my tally, um, the current vote count in the US presidential election is that uh, Vice President Joe Biden has 70 million votes roughly and a 50.2% share of the, of the, of the electorate. Uh, President Trump is at roughly 67 million and a 48.2% share. If President Trump were to find a path to an electoral college victory, it would be the third time in only 20 years that a popular vote winner was the electoral college loser. Um, and even if President, uh, excuse me, Vice President Biden prevails, one narrative I think is very clear at the moment, which is that there is a growing divide in the country between the majority or popular winner or popular candidate and the electoral college results. And to my mind, one very important question is whether social media is helping or hurting this dynamic. You could phrase this as an issue of polarization, but of course, it's not just a matter of how polarized we are. It's a matter of whether there's a divide between how we govern ourselves with respect to popular majority positions and 
what, what the prospects are of minority candidates or minority policy positions continuing to prevail in the country. In other words, quite ironically, what I think we face in the United States now is the prospect of minority rule in a democratic society. Our framers of the US Constitution were concerned about the tyranny of the majority over the minority. But what I think we have to face very clearly now is the prospect of an enduring and entrenched minority that finds its way to govern the country despite losing popular um, um, votes. Back to you, Renee, uh, back to you, Kelly. Thanks, Rob. So why don't we see if Nate, um, and we can now sort of move to every, everyone with cameras on and being engaged here. Um, Nate, the question that Rob posed about whether the pivot to mail-in voting creates long-term problems for future elections and what some of the administrative changes would need to be made to address that. Also, if you have any thoughts on the, the challenge of minority rule. Um, and then we'll turn to Alex and Renee for uh, Rob's question about the model of EIP uh, being feasible at scale moving forward? So on the first question, there's, um, let me give the good news side of this, which is that I think the, some of the changes that were made in order to deal with the pandemic in this election are ones that are going to be permanent. So I think that a lot of the mail-in voting that was uh, rolled out in some of these states, I would even think California, um, may be you know, here to stay. Um, because they, you know, experience very few problems, and and there are a lot of reasons election administrators might prefer it. However, there's good ways and bad ways to do mail-in voting, and that's what we're seeing. And one of the problems that um, has arisen in these these final days is that um, there's clearly a problem when you don't allow these states to pre-process the absentee ballot. So if you're worried about, as, as Rob was, about the the um, waiting for the final count. One way to address at least some of that is to allow them to process the absentee ballots, maybe even count them as they come in. And uh, there are other countries that do it like that, um, um, mainly through, you know, individual, when they when do sort of rolling uh, elections. Um, and so that's, there, are, there are ways that you could address some of these problems if we had a coherent bipartisan coalition that was willing to do so. I mean, the, the, the Democrats in Pennsylvania wanted to allow for pre-processing of the absentee ballots, actually not just in Pennsylvania, across the board, but it became a, a politically polarizing issue because the Republicans wanted some other things um, dealing with, not, not for example, allowing late arriving ballots. And so since they couldn't come to an agreement, they left the current system in place. That current system, is a legacy for you know not, not that long ago when these places were only having five percent absentee ballots, right? And so now you have the lack of pre-processing, and you have half the ballots coming in through the mail. And so, so you know these are solvable problems, and you can see that by the fact that many other states were able to address them. Um, and so, you know, if if we were running on a on a, a clean slate here, we would have federal legislation that would establish procedures for mail balloting that would be uniform it would also integrate the postal service uh, in this i do think rob you are right that yes the pivot to mail balloting in a sense fed the narratives that the president trump has put out there but that there's a kind of <laughs> you know chicken and egg problem here which is you know you we needed to ensure voting with social distance we could have the, the, the safest way especially early on to do so was to move to mail balloting um, at the same time, you know, we, we retrofitted polling places to make sure that, they, that people could safely vote. Um, I think that one of the ways to, to, one opportunity for bipartisan compromise here is to allow for the distribution of mail ballots, but to um, encourage ballot drop boxes and other ways of people dropping off the, the ballot so it looks like an intermediate kind of option between mail balloting uh, and polling place voting. And maybe there's there's an opportunity there, but it really depends on, on the state. Great, thanks, Nate. And somehow you managed to answer a question right as it came into the Q&A, which was whether there should be a national standard for conducting elections at all levels. So, uh, so well done and well, well done. Uh, let me just say that I wouldn't go that far, and, th and th that's a longer story as to how the diversity within the states makes it very difficult to have a com complete national standard, but there are certain baselines that we, we should have for mail balloting and other things. Great, thank you. Um, Alex and Renee, I wanna to turn to the question that 
um, that Rob had posed about EIP as a model. And then I have a whole queue of questions for various folks here, but if others on the line want to continue uh, adding questions to the Q&A, I will try and deal with those as they come in. Yeah, so uh, it sounded a little bit like Rob is volunteering us uh, to do a lot more work uh, globally. I, I'm not... The, the, the Facebook Supreme Court hasn't started operation yet, and you guys um, seemingly have done incredible work in a relatively short amount of time, and it's a partnership. It's not just one outfit. So it right. seems like a potential model for civil society partnership with the platforms and even a kind of, you know, sort of governance. Right. So I, I do think there is an opportunity here for a couple things. One, I think, is for civil society to operationalize our work, right? So part of the goal of this was those four institutions that are part of our group were all going to write a report three months after the election of these are all the horrible things that happened. What we thought is like, well, let's move that work forward so we can actually have impact in real time. And then we can still write the report. And that's a big part of what we're going to be doing now is we'll have a big joint report of everything we saw and some recommendations and such. So I, I, one, I think operationalizing this stuff is great. Um, the, yeah, we have a lot of lessons that we'll probably document about trying to do this within an academic institution. Ironically, COVID was actually a big plus for us here because it created a pool of really talented students at Stanford who were taking minimal classes or taking no classes uh, and who were very politically motivated. And so we were able to recruit. Um, now that, that can be overcome by recruiting way ahead of time, but our ability to put this together during COVID was actually helped by that and, and the fact that everybody could work from home pretty easily. Um, you know, I think those worked. I, I think the thing that's going to have to be figured out is data access, right? So that the thing that makes this not scalable is, you know, in this case, a lot of the stuff we were looking for was public content, right? Um, which is somewhat of a special case for the United States, right? Like political disinformation in other countries is generally very hard to get at. So one, figuring out a way to either interact with, as we talked about the WhatsApps and the like, um, or smaller groups, or to have the language skills involved is going to be a challenge. The next big, there's something like probably 70 or 80 election a year that are, are important enough that you'd probably want to have eyes on them. The next one coming up is Sunday in Myanmar. Um, the 2015 general election in Myanmar led to significant political violence. And so obviously that's the kind of thing you'd like to have eyes on. Problem is, is very few people speak the right languages outside of the country. And it's hard to have folks in country do this because the violence is being perpetrated by the government. So you can't like safely have, you know, civil society members doing this work uh, as part of a partnership in country, you'd put them at risk. And so I, I think there's like a lot of interesting challenges on the international perspective perspective, but kind of the core one is going to be a governance structure that allows access to data because the doing this work is directly running into privacy laws globally. Um, and there is no exception in CCPA, uh, the California law, which was uh, amended yesterday for research. There's no direct exception for research in GDPR in Europe. Um, there's a number of other privacy laws that go run in head and, and Nate in his work in social science one has, has dealt with this a lot, wrote a very good chapter, Josh Tucker in his book which we can put a link in uh, available for free. Um, yeah, and Nate can, can wave it around. Uh, and, uh, but that, that's what we're gonna have to figure out. As for governance, I mean, I think this is more of an accountability structure, right? Where we have the ability to, we'll have a big report of this is how the companies did and this is what they did well on and they didn't. Um, on actual governance, I think kind of, hopefully we could support the kind of non-governmental review boards and the like that are hopefully getting set up. And, and so maybe this could be part of something. Thanks, Alex. And I'm so glad you brought up this question of data access, which I think is one that has really been plaguing all of us and I think is just essential in moving this whole field forward. Uh, we have 10 minutes. I have more than a dozen questions, so I'm going to try and do a lightning round. I have um, three that I'll direct at Alex and Renee, uh, three that I'm going to direct at Nate, uh, one or two I'm going to send Andy to you, and then a question that I want to pose to everyone here, uh, which is a, a take your pick between the biggest surprise uh, this election cycle for you or one policy recommendation uh, that you would most strongly advocate for either by government uh, or by the platform. So I'm sort of taking moderator's prerogative. So I will come to that choice of two questions at the end. Um, first, Alex and Renee, three for you. Um, which techniques seemed most effective this election cycle? Uh, two, anything around monetization trends and what you saw uh, there. There was a question about influencers and how to handle uh, this challenge actually that just um, came in. And then um, do you have any research that is publicly being shared that isn't just about the content that you are seeing, but that is tracking trends either across platforms 
or across geographies, or is that forthcoming in the final report? So um, good luck remembering those uh, four questions on three hours of sleep uh, with uh, nine minutes left in the call. <laughs> Go ahead, Renee. I've got it. I've got it up over here so I can see it. Um, we do post things uh, for public consumption on issues other than elections, io.stanford.edu. Uh, we have, uh, in addition to as the election project is being wrapped and the big report is coming out, uh, we will also have the report for the virality project, which is our COVID-19 uh, project and some of the mis and disinformation pathways related to that. Uh, we've also done some work that is related to, I think also I see Stephen Levy's question, does the 2020 experience change your view of what of, of, of social media's impact here? Um, and I would say we, we've done some work now, a number of different reports for the Virality Project, the Election Integrity Partnership, uh, and also a white paper we put out on China, which feels like six months ago, but was really like eight weeks ago, um, related to how China was running uh, information operations. And again, I think one of the things that we see is both a top-down and bottom-up sort of simultaneous approach. It is not just narratives moving from social media, uh, having a profound impact on social media and kind of staying there. What we see instead is social media conversations, chatter, memes, et cetera, making their way to uh, the nightly news by way of some, you know, kind of the traversal of the various audiences and pathways that social media affords uh, people for for carrying content. Uh, and then we also see top down where we see um, a report will emerge on a television program and then will gradually be discussed, digested in the social communities that trust the influencer or television channel that put it out. Um, so I think one of the things that we've seen is really the emergence, I would say, you know, to the question of, um, uh, you know, has, has uh, our view changed of what happened in 2016 with Facebook and social media, I would say really at this point, social media is a channel in that pathway. It is no longer a distinct thing. And so we need to stop treating this as a question of media or social media and recognize that uh, each, each uh, speaks directly to different audiences, sometimes overlapping audiences. And uh, thinking about information integrity requires having a more holistic view of, uh, of how that content is spreading. And we try to really focus in on that when we do our reports. Did that Thanks, all of them? Alex? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is I think uh, Renee is totally right. And the place we should look for this getting really interested is around COVID in 2021 and specifically around the vaccines. Um, I, I think foreign influence in our elections has always been overblown. I, that was true in, about the 2016 election. It's domestic disinformation has always been much more important, um, but that is absolutely, totally quantitatively true for 2020. Um, so maybe we can move beyond kind of this this focus on specific adversaries who want us to talk about them all the time and talk more about kind of the overall uh, media and uh, kind of intellectual environment uh, for American democracy. Um, and in 2021, though, the place where we might see some foreign action is around the COVID vaccines because there's a national security, national pride aspect to that that, that is going to be really interesting. Great. Thank you both. Um, Nate, I want to turn uh, to you. We have a couple of questions here. Um, appreciated the uh, I believe it was eight scenarios that your team put forth, you know, before the elections in this sort of December 14 to January 16 period, um, January 6 to 19 when Congress is sort of counting. And so would love to hear, you know, what is it that you're most concerned about now moving forward if one of these um, comes to mind? And um, there's a question, a very specific one about the Wisconsin recount process now that we have seen um, Trump's campaign managers stating um, that they will call immediately for a recount, what will that look like? Um, and then uh, very glad to see John Etchemendy here joining us. There's a question about how 2000 and 2004 looked with no social media. John, if you can elaborate a little bit on that, would love to uh, get to your question as well. But Nate, we'll have you. Oh, and then one last question, Nate, to you. Um, the, what is the real justification or the best justification for why mail-in val ballots can't be counted as they are coming in? Let me deal with the last one. And I'll have to be very quick here since we've only got five minutes. The, the, um, the argument for for counting mail ballots on, only on election day, one argument is to make is to deal with the problem of what happens if people try to vote twice, if they vote absentee and you count them, count it earlier, and then they show up in the polling place, which ballot should prevail? And so um, there are you know several states. If you have counted the absentee ballot and taken it out of its secrecy sleeve and, and, and envelope and the like, then you won't be able to resolve that. You'd have to count the absentee ballot. So, so then there's the possibility that someone could be disenfranchised as a result. I mean, that's the basic kind of argument. Um, secondly, uh, uh, you're, I mean, 
uh, what was what was John's question again? John? Uh, John's going to elaborate on it if he oh, okay. uh, if he is listening at present. Um, the Wisconsin recount and what we should see uh, going forward. They, I mean, we've had recounts in Wisconsin before, um, and the you know, there's first of all, there's an administrative process to recount the ballots. They'll be done by hand. There's these are these are paper ballots. If 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 it, a recount is in the offing, you there you you. Um, depends on what the margin is as to whether you get an automatic or, or um, you have to plead a recount. And, and then what we'll see is um, if in the recount there are disputed ballots, then that will there, there's a state process to deal with those disputes that would ultimately um, you know, be dealt with with both the election uh, commission. They've changed some of their laws on this in the last five, seven years. And so uh, whether it goes through the election commission or then goes to the state system up to the state Supreme Court. But remember, if we're in that mode, you should expect some federal court action as well on um, how the ballots have been dealt with. Great, um, thank you, Nate. So we now have uh, just two minutes left. So I wanna save one minute for um, next steps, um, but would love to just turn to um, Andy, a question about how news organizations should cover incitements to violence, if you have thoughts on that. And then um, just a quick round robin from everybody on either your biggest surprise or your number one policy recommendation uh, to improve things moving forward. Yeah, so you know, I think that there's a difference between you know, carrying a, a live speech and then reporting on what was said in it. Uh, you know, and, and it, you know, it's not like in, in all cases a news organization news organization can, can predict whether a candidate will incite violence. Uh, but if that happens, um, you know, uh, my my hope would be that um, that the story would be contextualized and that um, you know the, the call to violence would would not be just you know reported as uh, you know without without um, any any further um, context around it. Thank you. Uh, agreed. Um, quick round robin. Surprises, policy recommendations. Surprises, the polls. How's that? You know. Thanks, <laughs> I, thanks Nate. So as a political scientist, I mean, that's Nate, what actually, surprised everyone, right? You know, again, they were wrong by a lot, and so we're, they were going to have to, you know, take them to the woodshed. <laughs> and Nate, as a political scientist, it's a, actually, it's an interesting question. Has anybody? looked at using kind of online sentiment analysis and such to replace the poll? Like, is there any good research into something that is better than calling people's landline phones and trying to get them to pick up? Yeah, well, most of the polls are not just landline these days. I mean, so much of them are, are internet based. And yeah, there are there are people who do, like you said, sentiment analysis, search analysis. Um, the, the people that I was following, this uh, not to, uh, I have no special gift here, but the people that I was paying attention to did seem to get this right. And, and, and they were not looking at the polls, but they were looking at the, um, just the demographic groups and, and the pace of early voting and some other stuff that was happening in the voter registration. Um, you know, for example, they told, indicated very early about the rising support for President Trump among racial minorities. Uh, particularly men. And, and that was something that, you know, I think it came to fruition as well as the mobilization among non-college whites in rural areas. Other quick thoughts on surprises or policy recommendations before we close? Maricha. I mean, maybe just a sort of obvious one, but still I think important is the link between tech and non-tech. So uh, who would have predicted that the postal services would have been the cliffhanger here? And similarly, we uh, also at the Cyber Policy Center talk a lot about tech platforms, tech policy, and that's our focus. But I think that the more traditional media, TV, newspapers are still incredibly powerful also in amplifying disinformation or unverified claims. And so... I think it's really important to stay up to date with where uh, challenges are and not so much uh, use the methods of last election for uh, for the present day. And I guess that goes for looking at any kind of malign interference through disinformation and otherwise. Thank you. Maricha, any final thoughts from folks before we close? At the risk of sounding um, a bit uh, stereotypical about what a philosopher might say. I, um, if the pollsters and social scientists have, have egg on their face, um, yet again, this go round. Um, the big picture question for me is that uh, philosophers or democratic theorists have for a long time, as in hundreds and hundreds of years, warned that democracies 
are vulnerable in particular to um, populist demagogues. And that we see happening across the world, not just a phenomenon here in the United States. And uh, I think it, it, it causes me a worry of a certain kind that navel gazing a bit here of what I would predict is going to happen next within you know, the academy. Intellectuals will find new reasons to be suspicious of democracy itself rather than contributing to the revitalization of the very institutions that have governed our lives um, productively for so many decades. Thank you, Rob. I think that that is a good place to end. Uh, and uh, just a huge thanks to everyone here. Uh, we have managed to get through 30 questions and uh, managed to get through months and months and months of work uh, leading up to this. And I think quite a bit of work that will follow. I think it's good to note that the most upvoted question came from Daphne, which was actually, a, is there a way that we can show our support to everybody here and send them gifts of some form or another, coffee, pastries, and so forth. So I think just honestly, a huge, huge amount of thanks to, to all of you for the work that you have done here. Um, it, it's really, really remarkable. Um, and I'm just so grateful to, to work alongside of you. So thank you. Um, hope there's more coffee coming to you. Um, and uh, with that, I think we'll just change uh, over to uh, next steps, which will just be a quick, uh, I should note this will be posted online and on our Twitter feed and everything else. Um, but next steps, uh, we have a couple of webinars coming up. I think the next one will be on November 18th um, with Frank Fukuyama and other colleagues uh, here at Stanford and elsewhere talking about new ideas and antitrust. We will have a conversation with Sam Weinberg and others at Stanford on challenges to digital literacy education. Uh, we will then on the 10th have a larger uh, debrief with Nate, uh, Alex, Renee, and a few others from our team on uh, digital technology, social media, and the 2020 election that will be a half day event. And then we'll be discussing a new book, um, Which Side of History, which several of our colleagues have contributed to that uh, has been organized by Common Sense and others uh, in January and other things still being planned after that. But most importantly, just a huge thanks uh, to everyone here for, for all of the work that you've done and for taking the time uh, to join this morning. And I hope we have more definitive answers about who will lead the free world uh, really soon. So <laughs> take care everyone and thanks again.